Hello and welcome to the first in a series of tutorial videos for Crusader Kings 3, version 1.0.2. At this point, Crusader Kings 3 has been out for less than 48 hours, so some of this information may change in the near future, but I hope it'll still remain somewhat relevant, informative, or at the very least, entertaining. So we're going to go over the very basics of the game today, just getting started, how to play as a character, getting married, and just the very bare bone basics. If you've played Crusader Kings 2 in the past, some of this information may, may be somewhat redundant, but I'm still gonna go over it as there have been somewhat minor changes. If you'd like to skip ahead, I'll go ahead and place some timestamps in the description so you can kind of look at things that you may wanna look at or just skip the video entirely. Without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get into a game here. So first thing you're gonna notice when you get into the game is Paradox has presented you with a series of characters which they have determined to be either somewhat interesting, historically significant, or simply to provide a positive playing experience. In my opinion, you can't really go wrong with any of these particular characters as your first ones. Perhaps stay away from some of the hard starts, but honestly, all of these will provide excellent playing experiences. But that's not what we're gonna do. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and select this button in the bottom left-hand corner, and that'll let us choose to play as any one of the characters on the gigantic Crusader Kings 3 map. As you can see here, there is an entire world for you to choose from, but do not feel overwhelmed. We're gonna go ahead and just start as one of these characters, the High Chieftain of Greater Poland. Now, suppose that you wanted to get started, but you didn't wanna play as the High Chieftain. All you have to do is select on a country, let's say East Francia, but you don't wanna play as Charles. So you go ahead and scroll into the map, and first thing you're gonna notice is that all of these different sub uh, characters get highlighted. So let's say the Duchy of Anjou. So let's say you wanted to play as the Duke underneath France rather than the King himself, or perhaps even further down than that, you wanted to play as this single county count. What you're gonna see here is these arrows dictate the different liege organization. So my liege is this Duke here, and his liege is this kingdom here. So that's how these arrows work, and it'll let you select any particular character that you would like to play on the map. But like I said, we're gonna go ahead and get started with this High Chieftain here. Now, as far as game rules are concerned, you will have to enable Iron Man if you would like to earn achievements. The only thing we're going to change is we're gonna go ahead and turn Generate Families to AI only. And the reason we're going to do that is we do not want the game to generate us a wife, and we do not want it to generate children. We'd like to go over that ourselves, so that's the only game rule that we're going to change. Now, as you load in here, you might be a little overwhelmed with some of these things, but do not worry about it. We're going to get all of these out of the way. But first things first, let's go over our character. So our character is a brave, honest, arbitrary man who is a tough soldier, a military engineer, and gallant. So these three on the left here are your personality traits. These are much more impactful, sort of character-defining uh, attributes that your character has. If you act against them, you'll gain stress, and they provide these various benefits as you can see here. The ones that glow green like this are considered virtues, the ones that glow red like that are considered sins, and the ones that do not glow at all are just neutral. They have all of these effects here, but Virtues provide you with an additional piety per month, as well as 10 opinion from all of your faith, and these sins provide the exact opposite. You can tell which Virtues and which sins are for each religion by clicking on the bottom left-hand corner here. If this is Catholicism, uh, Slavic faith, doesn't matter, it'll be right here, and it'll tell you the sins and virtues of your religion along with all of the different tenants. Don't worry about these, we'll go over these in another video. The second thing you're gonna notice on the right-hand side here is going to be your education trait. So your education trait can be any one of these five different categories here, diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, or learning. In our case, we have a martial education. These two stars indicate that it is the second level of that education, it provides us with plus four martial and plus 20% martial experience. If you click here, it'll open up the encyclopedia. You can look up literally anything about the game that you would like to know. It is rather intensive. Uh, otherwise, you can also hover over a thing 
you're going to see that the border color changes. It is locked on, at which point you can hover over anything blue and it'll teach you about it. For instance, this teaches you about education traits and it'll tell you about it here. We can learn about lifestyles, we can learn about Marshall, and if you just hover over long enough, the border changes color and you can hover over and you can just keep going down the totem pole as you see here. So. In our case, the various education traits, as I mentioned, so let's go ahead and look at those. One star indicates plus two of the respective stats and plus 10% lifestyle experience, and that just scales linearly all the way up to level four, as you see here. So the second type of trait you're gonna see to the right here is a commander trait. Now, not everyone has this, but we do because of our martial education and just our character starts with it. So there are tons of different commander traits. They all provide unique combat benefits when you are the commanding leader of an army. In our case, this reduces siege phase time by 30%. And to the right of that here, we have a lifestyle trait. Now lifestyle traits are earned by completing a specific tree in the lifestyles and you get the trait at the bottom. So our character already starts with all of these different abilities unlocked so we get the lifestyle trait of Gallant. If instead the game had given us Overseer, we would have the Overseer trait, and so on and so forth for all these different things here. Okay? Now, that is lifestyles. We're going to go over those in just a second after we talk about the last type of trait, which are congenital traits. So congenital traits are traits which are inherited by either you having them and your child has them or your spouse having them and your child has them it's a random chance um and it's sort of determined if either you have them or your wife has one it's a lesser chance if you both have them it increases so for instance let's go ahead and find somebody that's a genius let's see if we can do that so this is the character finder with all the different filters we don't particularly care about those we're just going to find any old person that is a genius so, if he has a child with his wife, you can generate either the genius trait or any one of the lower traits underneath it. So, each congenital trait has three different levels, similar to the education traits with different levels. And in this case, if we go to the thing to check here, uh, right below all of this. Sorry, I believe we passed it. I apologize. Here they are. These are the different education or uh, congenital traits rather. Now there are both positive and negative for each different version. So for instance, uh, homely is a congenital trait that is the opposite of comely. Now there are three levels to each of these as you can see and they have uh, linearly scaling effects with each different level. Now as I mentioned in the genius example, if he has a kid with his wife the kid can either be no inherited trait, a genius, intelligent, or quick. So you can actually inherit a trait that is lower than yours, it is a chance. If, for example, I had the trait intelligent and my wife had the trait intelligent, there's then a chance that my child uh, increases and actually goes up to genius. So that's something to sort of keep in mind as you mix and max your eugenics program for the future. That's sort of how congenital traits work. And you can always tell which one because it'll actually tell you this trait is congenital, okay? Perfect. So that's the last type of traits. Those are the four different types, your personality, education, commander, lifestyle, and congenital. So after that, we have our stats. As you can see here, all the different stats have various different effects. At eight diplomacy, there is neither a benefit nor a negative. Anything over eight provides a positive example. In the case of diplomacy, it will increase others' opinion of you, as well as increases the effectiveness of diplomacy schemes. Um, for martial, it is levy size with increased advantage in combat. Scheme discovery for uh, intrigue. Domain taxes and domain limit, which is not listed here for stewardship. And learning affects your piety per month and the prestige to increase count authority and so on and that just scales in either direction so anything under eight provides a negative anything above eight provides a linearly scaling positive okay the last trait here is your prowess 
Essentially, this is just your melee combat strength as an individual, as a duelist, and we'll get that into that later in the combat video. So the last thing we're going to talk about is, uh, before we get to marriage, is lifestyles. So because we have a martial education, we gain increased experience with this particular lifestyle. And we already start with this tree down here. Now, lifestyles are going to be something that as you play the game more, you're going to find that you dis like different trees. It can feel somewhat overwhelming, but when you first start out, I sort of just recommend picking something that you feel like you're going to do. So in our case, we kind of look at what we have here. And we're a small kingdom, or a uh, small duchy rather, with no vassals underneath us. So let's just kind of take a look and say, okay, so we don't really have to worry about how our subjects feel about us. So we don't really necessarily need, um, you know, we don't need to be scaring people, foreign affairs, vassal opinions, you know, diplomat. So dip diplomacy lifestyle doesn't seem like it really does too much for us. We could go family focus for extra fertility, but again, not the biggest issue. We're not gonna die anytime soon, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, but we do need to expand. And while we do have all of this here, all these lovely benefits from being gallant, uh, perhaps we wanna increase the strength of our troops because we're gonna be going to combat to try to secure our duchy, secure our neighbors, and so on and so forth. So we're just gonna start with something simple. We're gonna go martial. Um, we're going to go ahead and pick one of these three here. We'll get into these uh, different dread, control, all that later. We'll just go ahead and pick, let's say, um, authority focus. Why not? Sounds good. So we're going to go ahead and select that. And now we can't change that for five years, but we're going to gain 30 experience per month towards 1,000. This never changes. It's always 1,000. And when it gets to the top, we're going to go ahead and unlock the next ability. Great. So, like I said, lifestyles um, are just a whole bunch of different things here. And it can feel overwhelming, but don't worry about it. Just sort of pick what needs to be the suit of your country. So, for instance, if you have a very stable country, but you'd like to have more land underneath your direct control, or perhaps you're over your limit, then maybe you want to go towards stewardship. You want it towards increasing your taxes. You don't have to worry about it. You have a decent army. You have a stable realm. Perhaps you go down this way. If you are a vassal of other, underneath other characters, perhaps you want to become a schemer to try to make some plots and kill your liege, or try to secure and steal duchies away. Perhaps you want to go this way. Learning. Um, in the case of pagans, it's not particularly useful, uh, but we'll get into later how um, going down sort of some of these theologian stuff can be useful if you have a head of faith. And uh, diplomacy is useful if you want to have a bunch of vassals you want to manage, or just getting a big old grand family. It's not super useful for us because we have a terrible succession law, but again, we'll get into that in a bit. So the last thing we're going to get in this particular video, the last topic of discussion is going to be marriage. So we need a marriage because we don't currently have an heir, we will get a game over otherwise, and so we need a spouse. Now. There are three different things you can look for when you're getting a spouse. The first thing is an alliance. So let's say we wanted to ally up with the chief of Prussia over here. Um, we could potentially marry his sister. Uh, sorry, this is his brother. I apologize. Um, and um, so let's pretend that he had a sister. Or rather, let's find somebody who does. Uh, this is a child. I apologize about this. Okay, so this is not an example where I think I would go for it, but let's say we wanted to become him. So either his daughter or his sister will result in a marriage for us. So if we were to do this, for instance, and again, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend this actual example, but we're just going to do it to show it off. We would get an alliance with this guy because we are marrying his daughter. We'd be able to call him into wars and so on. This is not a good example of one because we actually want to take his land because he is in our duchy. We're going to get into that in the next episode, but that's an example. So you can marry for alliances if you are in a particular per, uh, precarious position. We are not, so we don't really necessarily need an alliance. It wouldn't be bad. You can marry for stats, so the stats of your wife, so that she can assist you, uh, which we will get into the next episode as well. Or we can marry for congenital traits. I'm going to go ahead and get started with trying to marry for a congenital trait. So we're going to use the marriage finder here. We're going to try to find a character. 
Um, uh, we're going to look at all. We want them to be insider diplomatic range because we can't talk to them otherwise. We want them to be any ruler. It doesn't matter in this case because we're going to be marrying a female. Uh, we want them to be an adult because we are 42, so we need to get a child relatively quickly. So we don't want to betroth ourselves to a genius 8-year-old or something. We need them to be female, unmarried, preferably not in prison, um, and of our religion group, because otherwise they won't accept. And then um, culture doesn't matter, dynasty doesn't matter. Um, now, in the case of pagans, we can actually intermarry with um, other pagans. So let's actually just go down this to all for now, because some of these other, while well, the Catholics won't say yes, for instance, if we were to do this, as you can see here, they would actually accept yes. So the, the pagans can intermarry with one another due to uh, this right here, I believe. Uh, fundamentalists, is that what it is? Anyway, I apologize, um, but culture groups, so all the Catholics can intermarry with all of the Christian religions. So um, Orthodox can marry into Catholic, for instance, but they cannot marry Muslims or pagans. Pagans cannot intermarry, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's go ahead and find ourselves a wife. Let's look for, like I said, all of the things will stay here as you click in and out, so you don't have to worry about it. Let's see if there's any geniuses out there. There might not be, but let's look for one. Okay. Uh, she is Greek, so they will not intermarry. As you can see, it says we consider them evil. They consider us evil. You're not going to be able to interact with them in any meaningful way. So, no geniuses. Let's look for the next one. Let's look for Herculean. And you'll be accustomed with what traits are what over time. Okay, so here's a Herculean one. She is 28. She is a content craven, who is also a tough soldier. Not super great stats, but not horrible. Let's just go for that, assuming they'll accept. And they will. So it'll tell you the chance of children, which is medium, which is good for us. Um, and they will be born into our dynasty. We're going to lose 200 prestige, which is not the end of the world. We'll get into prestige later. So let's go ahead and just go ahead and do that proposal. So we're going to get married in a second here. It should fire. So he accepts our marriage proposal. Excellent. And wedding celebration. You will always get this event when you get married. And you can either gain money, you can gain prestige. Um, in our case, we're going to go ahead and get some money. And we'll use that in the next episode of the tutorial. Um, prestige is not bad, of course. Uh, it's useful for all sorts of things. In Crusader Kings 3, you actually expend your prestige, your piety, your renown. You spend those to different claims, create actions, and um, we will go over that in the future. But that's where we're going to go ahead and leave off this one. I hope the game rules, the traits, the stats, and lifestyles make sense. And I will see you in the next episode as we continue as High Chieftain of Greater Poland, now with a beautiful new Amazonian wife who will hopefully get us some great Amazon, uh, strong Herculean children. Okay, I will see you in the next one.